Thank you all for being here first. Um, we had a great turnout. We're so excited that you're here to uh, encourage I know. appreciate uh, the awardees that we have. This session is uh, titled You Diversify, Inspiring Women Entrepreneurs. I am Dawn Cooper. I'm the CFO at Texas Women's Foundation, and I couldn't be prouder to be up here and introducing some really wonderful women who are going to share with you. I want to also recognize that we have some wonderful um, viewers online, and thank you for being here as well. Please use that chat and the Q&A. We will do our best to get to Q&A from both the audience and online, but we are having a little technical challenges there. But uh, it worked out that we had lots of questions in our last session. For those of you who would love to be in like four places at one time, don't fret, we are taping all of these and you will have access to all of the sessions as well as the keynote um, for about seven days using your registration code that you were given when you registered. So let's get started introducing some wonderful women. Our Mara Award recipient, Patricia Rodriguez Christian, um, is sitting here to far right. <coughs> Patricia is an entrepreneur executive with more than 20 years of C-level experience at privately held CRC Group Inc which is a group of family-owned companies. As CEO, she has provided leadership and direction at B2B and B2C companies in retail, restaurant, business processes, outsourcing, real estate, and construction, from startup through to maturity. She is a, she's passionate about making diversity and inclusion a priority in all endeavors. She serves on corporate and non profit boards, including co-president of Women Execs on Boards, Women's Business Council Southwest, Women's Business Enterprise National Council, and past president of DFW Hispanic 100, where she helped establish the Latina Giving Circle at Texas Women's Foundation. She serves as an independent board director at Act with Medical Inc. She has a BS in Business Administration from the University of Phoenix, a Master of Public, administration from the University of New Mexico, and is an alumna of the Harvard Business School with a Corporate Director Certificate. Also joining us in moderating questions is Farrell Kill. She is a partner with Jones Day. Farrell is a corporate attorney whose practice focuses on capital market transactions, corporate governance, and general corporate law matters. Her practice covers a variety of industries, including technology, financial services, consumer, retail, and industrial products. She also supports Texas Women's Foundation providing the coordination of the Jones Day pro bono work that we need on occasion. We appreciate all of you, and we appreciate both Patricia and Freya, and I will let you take it over. Thank you so much, Don, and thank you for the opportunity to be here and to support your work, and of course, Patricia. So, um, Just a quick thing on you know why, at least, we're here, Jones Day is here to support Texas Women's Foundation and to support you is that um, you know, we're trying to make our own organization represent the clients that we serve and 50% of those, you know, the people who those clients are serving are women. And so to us, it's important to really focus on this topic of diversity that we're gonna talk about today. Um, so let's get into it. All right. <laughs> so I think we're going to kick it off. I would love to hear about your entrepreneurial journey. Sure. Um, we've talked a little bit about kind of your childhood experience, so I'd love to hear more about that great story. And then also, you know, where does it go from there? Sure. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for, for asking me to be here today. Um, you know, we'll go back to my childhood, right? <laughs> so how, how did I end up uh, as an entrepreneur? Uh, most of you, well, those of you that are in education know what a Title I uh, school district is, right? It's, it's an economically, a, a community of low resources, right? Um, and so this is the community that I grew up in. Um, from El Paso, Texas, I uh, was born uh, there and uh, was raised and went to Socorro High School. Now, uh, you know, it never dawned on me when I was a little girl what Socorro means. And, you know, this is just the school district, but a literal translation of the word means help. So, so that, you know, it, it never really dawned on me until, you know, I, I was an adult and, and looking at, you know, you start to look back at, you know, how you got to where you're at. 
And, uh, you know, being in a Title I school, there was, you know, our, our community was predominantly Latino. And uh, my parents had a couple of jobs, um, you know, my dad's day job, and then he had a weekend evening job uh, doing landscaping uh, for, you know, really nice communities. And, you know, I remember when he would take us, you know, or, or we would drive by or he would go drop off a bid to somebody. You know, and, and that was the very first time I actually got to see, wow, there are like other neighborhoods that don't look like mine. <laughs> and so, um, so my mother as well was an entrepreneur. You know, they, they had six mouths to feed, you know. And uh, my parents are immigrants from uh, the state of Chihuahua uh, with a third and a sixth grade education. They are incredible learners. Um, but they just didn't have the resources. And so they encouraged us to go to school, get educated, and work really hard. And so my journey into entrepreneurship was because of them. You know, it started in our home. My mother um, sold uh, household goods, home goods, to women uh, in our community. Um, this was before the Walmarts, I'm, I'm kind of old, uh, before the Walmarts and the big box stores. And, uh, and those that, that were uh, in El Paso were about you know, 30, 40 miles away from where we grew up. And so she was a saleswoman and uh, she sold household goods you know, blankets, towels, you know, rugs, everything that a woman would need for her home on a payment plan. And so I was about 10, 11 years old, and my job was to fill out the sales contract. So I learned a lot of really valuable lessons very early on. One, the, 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 um, the, the need to document things, right? I think that's why, you know, my, my husband calls me his, his attorney because I read all his contracts first. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the need to document things, um, signatures, agreements are important. And so for those of you in the audience that want to be entrepreneurs, documentation is critical. You as an attorney would know that, right? Um, so, so that's where my journey started. And uh, I sold off my first business when I was 28 years old. It was a marketing, com a small marketing, uh, very boutique consulting. Um, and because I got tired of living out of a suitcase and I decided that I was gonna go back to school. Um, at the time, I, you know, I had a bachelor's degree, and as I was interacting with clients and customers, I found out that, you know, I really needed, like, another degree, right? And, you know, I was, I was telling you earlier that I'm, I'm a lifelong learner, and so uh, for, for me, going back to school was just, like, would be big fun, right? So, so I went back to school, uh, but that's, that's how my entrepreneurial journey started, and um, you know, it's, it's, I don't regret it. Um, I love it. I did have a couple of stints in, um, in a, a corporation, which, you know, I was there uh, long enough to figure out I didn't like it. And, uh, and then I did some really terrific work at the U.S. Department of Commerce, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. I was going to say, I think that's an important thing for people who, you know, are looking forward to how they're going to do it to, to hear more about how you've done everything and it's okay to do everything and then kind of find your way there. Yes. Um, I do think it'll also be helpful. Can you tell us just a little bit about CRC and kind of the, the breadth that, that goes sure. into that? And what you've um, done there? CRC group, uh, I founded uh, and, and I'm still the only owner uh, 22 years ago, 20 something years ago. Um, we started out uh, as, you know, doing business process outsourcing. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we manage the corporate mail room for large corporate customers. And so, you know, it's, it's a process that is uh, integral to an organization, but it's not the core function of, of any organization, right? It's a support service. Um, you know, through CRC Group, um, I'm, I'm so lucky, you know, this has been part of my entrepreneurial journey that uh, I married an entrepreneur as well. So when, when you go, uh, when you decide that that's the path you want to take, uh, you know, most of you are much younger than I am. And so, you know, as you choose your places to work, places in which to spend your time, um, you also have to be, you know, very careful about who you choose, uh, not just as business partners, but as a life partner. And so um, I was very fortunate to, to meet Larry. 
uh, who is an entrepreneur as well. And so, you know, he and I have, uh, have been in business together uh, and in all of our businesses. And so um, I've owned a, a florist, so on the, on the retail side, uh, construction with Larry. Uh, we have done real estate development together. And, you know, even, yeah. the restaurants yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've had a couple of restaurants and, you know, turned those properties and sold them off. So, um, it's amazing. Did that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, no, I just think it's helpful to hear how you can, you don't, you know, you, you can do a million different things and find success in it. And I just think that's inspiring. Um, okay, so for our next, our next kind of topic, um, so we'll get into how, you know, you help support women, but I think it would also be helpful to hear of any moment or a particular person when you look back on your career and your life as someone who was either an advocate for you or helped um, you know, pave the way for you in any way that was particularly meaningful? Yes, uh, you know, very early on in my career, um, you know, I, I told you that I, I sold off my, my first company and uh, I had a client, actually it was a, a client, who uh, contracted us to do some outreach work in uh, minority communities. Um, I was living in New Mexico at the time and she was an incredible uh, mentor, supporter, uh, advocate for me. Um, her name was so Sonia and oddly enough, she was from a tiny little Texas town called Do Doni, Donny, something. Like it's east of Waco, like in the middle of nowhere. Um, but uh, she was an SMU graduate and uh, she was my client uh, in Washington, D.C. at the U.S. Department of Commerce. And uh, so they contracted us to do some um, public hearings. At the time, this was before uh, universal um, telecommunication, you know, it exists now. You, you get a little fee in your, tele in your internet bill uh, to help fund uh, universal access service. So this was, you know, before all of this rolled out, uh, the U.S. federal government was doing public hearings, and so they hired us to do this community outreach, uh, outreach. and I loved it. I mean, I just loved uh, being the voice for, for underserved communities in particular. Um, you know, they were Native American communities, Latino communities, uh, you know, uh, El Paso, New Mexico doesn't have a very large African American community, but uh, the, the, minor the communities of color uh, were Native American and Latino. And so um, she saw how much uh, that meant to me, uh, the passion that it ignited it within me. And um, so I sold my business and uh, I went back to school and she kept tabs on me. And as soon as she found out that I had graduated, um, I had already taken a position before I graduated with this corporation that shall remain nameless. Um, and and uh, I, I moved to Dallas for the first time. And uh, you know, she said, I, I, I need you to come to join my team. And, but I, I had already committed to the organization. I was already in Dallas, you know, and, uh, I said, you know, you've got, you've got to give me some time uh, because I need to unwind that before I can, you know, go do something else with you. And so um, she, she, she moved me to D.C. and we worked together on a team to put together what is now called an MSI program. It was a program designed to, um, to meet the needs of the department, but also serve the needs of the minority community. And it was called Minority Serving Institutions um, Program. And, and I have my notes here because I, I, I wanna be sure that I capture uh, what the program was designed to do. It was to increase awareness at the U.S. Department of Commerce of the department itself and also the diversity of occupations. Um, most of you don't know that the U.S. Department of Commerce um, houses 13 bureaus, everything from the Economic Development Administration to in International Trade Administration, the MBDA, um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric um, uh, Administration is there to the Patent and Trademark Office and the Census Bureau. All of these fall under the, the umbrella of the U.S. Department of Commerce. And so they had a diversity issue. You know, there was a really big diversity issue. The department um, was very white. You know, it was very male and very white. And uh, so it was, it was her job to 
not really increased diversity because she actually ran the budgeting side, but she was passionate about this. And so she put together a team and I was on this team. And uh, we, uh, one of our first charges was to make sure that minority serving institutions of, of higher education, meaning Hispanic, uh, Hispanic serving institutions like the University of Texas system, uh, HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities, and tribal colleges. Um, many people don't know that tribal colleges exist as well, that these um, universities had access to, to grants, to grants that the US Department, that your tax dollars were funding, right? And so, um, so we paired uh, the universities with, uh, with MSIs, right? You know, HBCUs, HSIs, and tribal colleges. And then we took it a step further. Then we developed a uh, summer, um, summer work program for, uh, for aspiring college students and college students uh, to, to, um, to get them to, to learn about government, that there are good jobs in government, and because, you know, it, it, for most of you who come from communities of color, if you don't see it, it's very hard to aspire to something if you don't see it. And so we would bring um, college students in for a 10-week program over the summer. We would house them, and they worked in the department on a specific program. So that, that was what she tapped me to do. And so that was the beginning of what I call the rest of my diversity, equity, and inclusion career, and, and why it's so important to me, you know, as a person of color, but I, I also see the difference that uh, DE&I, and when it's done well, the difference that it makes in our communities. I love that, and there's a lot of, I'm, I'm writing down my notes on things to follow up on. Um, <laughs> but I guess the first one, and so this kind of dovetail, dovetails into the next thing we, I wanted to talk about, which is you know, how you work. What, what's so impressive about the MSI thing is that you're creating diversity in a very formal, you know, you're creating a structure for it that I think is critical um, to have that in place. Um, and so that's amazing, but my understanding is that you also encourage diversity in these other kind of softer, um, you know, maybe informal ways. And so I guess the question for you is, how are you in these organizations that you're working on, in whether it be your own business or the various boards that you serve on or all of the nonprofits that you help out with, how are you kind of creating these other paths that, you know, are, are getting the diverse and, you know, female care, um, you know, individuals, these experiences that are so critical? Well, it is, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not a one-woman show, you know. I'm, I'm deeply honored to be here uh, receiving, you know, the Mora Award, but it's, it, you know, I, I don't do anything by myself. You know, there are many women in this audience who are uh, part of that, uh, that informal structure, right? Um, how we do it is uh, we could do it very formally, right, with, uh, with DE&I, um, or we also do it very informally by mentoring others um, in, in the entrepreneurial space, by mentoring women of color, um, you know, and, and we have a couple of women in the room here that, that are part of the Women's Business Council Southwest. Um, who have been strong voices and advocates for the inclusion of, of women of color uh, in, in the entrepreneurial ranks. And the, the specific challenges that women of color face in particular, and helping to, to close that gap between access to capital and access to the decision maker and really just just being a support system that if if they see us in the room if they see women of color in the room it is it gives them a sense of belonging you know uh, i don't know i'm sure all of you have been in a room where you have been the one right whether it's because of gender or it, if it's because of you know your ethnicity or your race um, and when you see somebody else that that you can relate to, that that looks like you, that is, you know, that that is, you know, that could be you. Um, it is much easier to to get connected and to belong, which is, you know, our theme. You know, is is uh, it's about belonging. Yeah, it's actually someone at the Texas Women's Foundation once. Um, I was participating in their Leadership Institute, and they were saying that 
simply, you know, when you're having a bad day, you know, or your goal should always be to right, bring everyone else up with you. But if you're having a bad day and you're like, I just can't handle it anymore, <laughs> you know, I've got too much on my plate, you should take, you know, comfort in the fact that just existing and kind of, you know, doing, you know, going through the trenches and, and trying to make it, you know, as far as you can and, and being there and being either the woman or the person of color or whatever is, you know, helpful in and of itself. And so I've always kind Absolutely. of thought that that was, um, I don't know, encouraging on your, on your bad days, maybe to think, okay, at least I'm doing a little bit of good. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, you know, my, my family sometimes says, oh, you know, you're going to do one of those things again. How do you monetize that? <laughs> You know, as, as an attorney, you would know, right? It's like, you know, are, are those billable hours? Uh, you know, how do you monetize that? Well, you know, sometimes it's, you know, you, you know that when it is a passion of yours, it's not about the money. The money and I've always said this, and I say this to young students uh, or, or young uh, people in, who are just starting their careers. You know, if you love what you do, the money will follow. And, and you know, I think that's been part of our success as a family is that, you know, we, we love entrepreneurship, um, you know, and, and, you know, it's, it's, it's a passion. Um, I, I love being part of these movements that are very focused on bringing women up. You know, I have a passion for that. And, you know, it's not work. You know, the, the money follows if you love what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The thing that I wrote down that I wanted to ask is about Sonia, because I think, um, Something that young women, in particular, struggle with. I struggle. You know, everyone, every pretty much every female, uh, pr young professional I know struggles with this is finding their Sonia, and yeah. we have all of these, you know, formal programs, as I'm sure many of you do in your own organizations, where you are tasked with someone. And I think that's again setting mm -hmm. up these formal structures are important. But I think what you said, and that Sonia kept tabs on you. Like yeah. to me, that's incredible because there was no directive from the top to say you should keep up with Patricia you know Absolutely. she just did it because of the relationship so how do we you know find our Sonia <laughs> uh, you know what um, it's it's not that hard um, you know in our earlier session somebody was saying um, you know ask the why you know why why am I here and you know what is my contribution and be courageous. What I, I want, if if you walk away with nothing, walk away with this. Be courageous in the way you show up to work. What does that mean? Being courageous means that you're going to be vulnerable, and the way you find your Sonia is by asking. Listen, you know, this is my aspiration. Talk to your managers. Talk to your one level up and say, this is what I aspire in my career at this organization. I, if, if your goal is to be in the C-suite, let it be known. It may, it not gonna happen overnight. Um, you know, it's not gonna happen in five years, but it might in 10. Uh, but you need to ask to be mentored is one thing. Being sponsored is quite another. And that's what Sonia did for me. You know, she, she was my client. Before, you know, she, I didn't, I mean, I worked for her, right? Uh, but she saw something, I'm not sure what it was, probably the passion that I had for color, <laughs> communities of color. Um, but she sponsored me, you know, she, she got my employment application through the process. She, you know, you find your Sonia by asking, I need a sponsor. And nine times out of 10, it is not gonna be your boss. Nine times out of 10, it is going to be somebody else in a different part of the organization or outside uh, from, from another company. Um, getting that outside counsel, and like I said, being courageous uh, means being vulnerable. Um, if you ask somebody to mentor you and sponsor you, you're not gonna always be happy with what they tell you. Mm -hmm. It's going to be difficult to hear some of the feedback that you will get, but you have to be courageous and you have to be vulnerable. I love that. Um, so moving to kind of our next theme, which we've been touching on all of this, but um, so it'd be great to hear a little bit more about importance of diversity and the different ways that we're advocating for this equity and inclusion within our networks. And so, you know, we've obviously are, are touching on all of this, but one kind of saying that always sticks with me is, 
you know, you can invite someone to the dance, but if you don't invite them to dance, it's kind of pointless, you know what I mean? Like if you've ever mm -hmm. been an awkward middle schooler, you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess that, that's a question in, in terms of how, you know, you act as this entrepreneur. Um, how are you kind of um, organically incorporating um, diversity and, and, and advocating for that? You know, um, advocating for diversity, equity, and inclusion, you know, can take a lot of forms. Um, one is workforce, right? Um, two is supply chain. And then three is in the corporate boardroom. Um, and you will, you will hear some of these themes, you know, throughout uh, the other recordings. Um, workforce diversity uh, is, you know, what's happened over the last five years, I think, in particular, has, has brought this to, to the forefront. And um, I will tell you that, uh, that Wall Street, um, the SEC, is, is making, is, is being a little more transparent about it. Um, I, I wanted to share a couple of things with you. Um, BlackRock, a uh, very, you know, mm -hmm. big and uh, equity investment uh, company, in December, um, asked all of their portfolio companies to begin to disclose um, their data. You know, what, what does the employee pool look like? Uh, where, where are, you know, where, what is the ethnicity of your workforce? Does it look like your client base? Does it look like the communities that you operate in? Um, and let me tell you when, Larry, you know, it's kind of like the old saying, for those of you that are of my age, when E.F. Hutton, speaks people listen well this is like larry fink when larry fink speaks people listen oh, yeah. wall street listens um you uh and so the other thing that has happened uh this past year is the sec passed um, a rule uh for all nasdaq listed companies to require uh a, a minimum of two diverse board members on publicly traded companies uh, that, that have five or more board directors. Um, and so they were actually given resources as well. Um, you know, the resources, um, they actually pointed to a couple of nonprofit organizations, the board list, Equilar, and board, um, I'll think of the, the third one, um, so that they could source, you know, uh, board directors. And so when, when you talk about, you know, you, you could do this in a very structured way or you can, you, can, you know, what are the other ways of doing this? Um, those are, you know, the, the three areas where you can look to, to increase diversity. Mm -hmm. So it's funny that you mentioned the NAT. I, my, my practice area is actually to advise publicly traded companies on mostly their corporate governance and board structures. Mm -hmm. And so dealing with this new NASDAQ rule over the past year has, we just ended proxy season, you know, yeah. it's mostly behind us. And it's been deal talking to all of our very large, you know, public company clients about how they're practically doing this, you know? So it's been fascinating to see um, take the taking action as a, you know, having to put, you know, money where their mouth is, I guess. Um, I, you know, maybe a less uh, optimistic view of all of this and something that I find is never explicitly said by anyone, but it's something that I feel like probably everyone may understand what I'm about to say is when you hear someone say, you know, usually it's a white male who's the GC of a company or something like that, who says, oh, well, you know, they're, um, you know, they're our, our female or they're our, you know, they're gonna be able to, how do you kind of take a minute, compose yourself, and be graceful <laughs> about this? Or how do you, how do you, or not be graceful about it? I mean, how do you, have you encountered that? I would be surprised if not. And, and you know, how do we kind of tackle that issue of like this new requirement that mm -hmm. people aren't necessarily embracing with open arms? You know, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge in every corporate boardroom, um, and you know, there we we have the California law, right, that uh, requires uh, way more diversity than than uh, than what the Nasdaq rule um, requires. But you know, there's there's always going to be those that don't want change. Um, you know, and and it's it's really about change. It's about our corporate boardrooms, uh, our C-suites in our organizations looking like America, looking like the rest of the planet. You know, we, 
we don't operate in a vacuum anymore. You know, we, um, the events from across the world affect how we do our business, how we run our business. And so if, if we are this, you know, giant global, you know, publicly traded organization, uh, its leadership should reflect uh, that as well. Um, you know, I, when, when those comments come across, I see it as an opportunity to, to, to step up to the plate, right? And say, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, my gender has absolutely nothing to do with what I bring to the table, right? Uh, because you have to be vetted. No, nobody gives you anything to be, you know, I mean, you know, it's not like a present and here, you know, you take up this, this space and you, you know, just sit there and don't say anything. Um, you have to perform, you know, in, in a corporate boardroom, you have to perform. And so the talent that you bring is, you know, an opportunity to, to, to throw down those barriers and say, you know, this is what I bring to the table. I bring expertise in X, Y, and Z. Um, it's also one of the reasons why, you know, we founded one, one an, another nonprofit that, that I'm heavily involved in, um, the Women Execs on Boards, because we were finding that this was the case. You know, we, we just couldn't get uh, women into the corporate boardroom, right? So, so what do we do about it? We built a network that prepared women to serve uh, through education, through networks, and let me tell you, 99% of how you get into a boardroom is one, your skill set, and number two, your network. It's mm -hmm. critically important that, that if that's what you want to set your sights on, that you build that network and that you're very intentional about it. I think that, I don't know, to the people who were in the, um, the session before us, I think yeah. you were listening to them saying, be excellent, yeah. and the rest will follow, which I thought was great advice. And then I also just think, you know, I don't ever want to be asked to be you know, a professional because I'm a woman, but I also find that being a woman is kind of a superpower in the way that I act and, and maybe, you know, so it's a fine balance of trying to ignore being a woman, being there because of your being a woman, but also acknowledge that, you know, we bring unique and great perspectives. Absolutely, tonight, and so. you know, um, and I'll say that the research actually has borne it out that uh, when you have a diverse board, when you have women in leadership, your corporation is actually going to perform better. It, we can't help it, we just do things really well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It, it, the research bears it out. You know, I'm not just saying it because I'm a woman. The research has borne it out. When you have a diverse leadership team, a diverse boardroom, your company will do better. It just does. It is what it is. It's the data, people. <laughs> so we're getting to the tail end of um, before we open up for questions. But quickly, do you have any other particular advice for this next generation of women who, who want to be where you're sitting, you know? in however many years time? You know, I, I would say um, be excellent at what you choose to do. Um, whether, you know, you're an engineer or, you know, an artist, uh, lean into that passion. Uh, if you're a doctor, lawyer, uh, be excellent. Um, that, that, that's what will propel you. Um, if, if your journey is entrepreneurship, um, lean into that. Uh, I, I, I told you earlier, I'm a lifelong learner. Uh, Any time that we have uh, launched a business and or acquired one, um, I have, you know, thrown myself into, um, into learning, you know, taking, going to blueprint reading courses and, uh, you know, getting my broker's license, you know, all of those things, you know, and, and these are things that people don't know about me, but, you know, be excellent at what you choose to do. Uh, that will serve you well. That's great. And then finally, um, can you tell us briefly what it means to you to be a recipient of the Mara Help Women Helping Women Award? Well, I, as I said a little bit earlier, I am uh, honored, uh, thrilled and honored. Um, uh, I actually didn't apply, this on my, uh, apply for this on my own. I had a few uh, people nudging me uh, there in the room mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, who grilled me. Well, what about this? Haven't you done this? And haven't you? So I say all that to say that this is not just a recognition for me. It really is a recognition for uh, so many of the women that are in this room, the women that have allowed me to be a part of their lives and their organizations. 
um, so that I could live out my passion, uh, and that is, you know, the the inclusion of women at all levels, from supply chain to the corporate boardroom. And so I, I thank all of you because you have allowed me to be part of that journey. Thank you. Um, and so now I think we'd love to take any questions. Dawn, if that's okay, is that all right? Yeah, I see okay. some people really wanting to give a hand to these wonderful ladies. <laughs> Very inspirational to hear from both of you, and I'm sure everybody thinks so too. But there's got to be some questions out there. So while you think of questions, I'm going to steal one from our last session. So what do you do in your free time? What's your <laughs> hobbies? What you're on this learning journey all the time? Surely you have some sort of outlet for downtime. You know, I don't have hobbies. I mean, you know, I I love to read. Um, I really do give my free time to the organizations that I love, um, you know, and, and they all involve women, you know, the empowerment of women, uh, women execs on boards, uh, the Women's Business Enterprise National Council, the Women's Business Council Southwest, and um, the Latina Giving Circle. You know, we didn't talk very much about that, but... You go uh, ahead and you share a little bit about that, because I know you're proud of that as well. Yes, uh, extremely proud proud to have led again with a team of, of other women uh, from Hispanic 100, the establishment of the Latina Giving Circle, again, to give access to nonprofits that are serving minority communities. And we felt that, you know, there were other giving circles already at the table and we needed a seat at that table to continue to empower uh, the community. Anybody can give to the Latina Giving Circle. You can go on to the uh, Texas Women's Foundation website. Um, you don't have to be a member of anything. If you wanna donate and support uh, any one of the minority communities, whether it's the Orchid Circle for the Asian community or the Village for the African American community, uh, and then we have the Latina Giving Circle for uh, the Hispanic community. Thank you, Patricia. We're pretty proud of our giving circles. Yes. Every year, their giving and their great need goes up and up and up exponentially, and it is just incredible to watch. Okay, we have a question. Hi, Ms. Patricia. I'm Serena Davidson. I'm from El Paso, Texas, so welcome. Hey. Thank you for your talk today. But I have a hard question for you. So I'm 25 years old, probably one of the youngest in the room, if not the youngest. Um, so as I'm looking to projecting my career and building my network, which I feel like I've done a pretty good job so far. One of the biggest things that I've always learned is what not to do. So my question to you would be, what are the three things that I should not do as I get older and go into my career and build my network? What not to do? <laughs> tough question. That is a tough question because we always tell people what they should be doing, right? Yes. Uh, let me tell you what you should not do. Don't ever apologize for asking a question or for expressing your point of view. Show up with your authentic, total self. Because if you don't, you are not only cheating yourself, but you are depriving your employer, your family, your friendships from the terrific person that you are. So don't ever apologize for asking the question or for being you. Noted. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's another question. I can don't start. Oh, I get over here. I think that many of us have um, some level of limiting beliefs about myself. Uh, about, oh, I'm speaking for myself now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Tree. <laughs> My question for you is, um, what limiting beliefs did you have about yourself? You know, I think that as, as women sometimes, uh, or, or women where sometimes you're the one in the room, right? Uh, you go to a construction meeting and you're like the girl in the room or the woman in the room. Um, I think that one of the biggest limiting factor that I see women suffer from is imposter syndrome. Um, feeling that, you know, perhaps somebody's gonna discover that you're not worthy of being in that chair or in that seat because you're the first woman in, in that role, right? Um, 
how do you, how do you talk yourself out of that? You, you know, you you feel you you have the feelings, and you know, every once in a while, we we all still have that feeling, right? But the fact of the matter is that you've been given an opportunity, and it's it's not necessarily you know that uh, that you're the first one. It's what are you going to do when you are there? You know, what, it is an opportunity for, and, and that's, that's how I talk myself out of that imposter syndrome. You know, this is an opportunity for me to do something great. Not just for me, but for whomever uh, I'm doing it for. And secondly, to see how I can leave that ladder down and bring somebody else up with me as well. So that, that imposter syndrome is an opportunity Tell yourself, it's an opportunity for me to do something terrific and to help bring somebody else along so that they can do something terrific as well. And I think as women, we are often thinking about how to help others, except sometimes when it comes to our career, putting that emphasis on um, who we're yeah. helping as we go there. Other questions? I see one. Well, there's one right here, which will get me halfway to the one in the very back. So let's start here. Hi, Hi. my name is Samantha. I work in commercial real estate, which is very male-dominated industry. Yes. Um, sometimes I find myself as the only woman in the room, yeah. and um, because of my gender and my age, um, other men in the room are given kind of the title of expert um, before they even open their mouths, and then. Um, <coughs> You know, it, it's funny how people appoint themselves as the expert in, right? <laughs> um, you know, take, take a page from that book and, you know, you, you are at the table for a reason, right? Um, you are there because you bring a talent and expertise in whatever it is that you're doing. You know, maybe it's retail for you, maybe it's, um, you know, you're on the leasing side, maybe you're, you know, whatever it is. Um, don't don't shy away from speaking to your experience and allowing your experience to to be at the forefront you know you're the expert in whatever it is that, that you have done because that is all that you have done right uh, and so you know everyone has their role uh, but you know, just because somebody is a self-appointed expert doesn't mean that they really are. Um, I think that you, you should be proud of the skill and the talent that you walk in with because that's why you're there. One more question. You know, uh, mentoring and uh, shadowing programs are really terrific. Um, career details are also, um, it, they're done more in the public sector than they are in the private sector. But I will tell you that um, assigning somebody to a different department or uh, in, a, in a special project is always a really terrific way to get noticed. Um, the other thing is look to what is what is upcoming. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about this in our previous sessions. Cybersecurity is a really big deal. Um, ESG. Um, you know, many more corporations are beginning to pay very, very high attention to ESG. Um, Look for assignments that will that will not only you know highlight your expertise but give you extra um, visibility outside of your department, visibility across uh, departments and above your direct report. 
Um, and uh, the, you know, the other thing that, that you can do um, if you're looking to increase your diversity, equity, and inclusion is ask who is accountable for all of that. You know, accountability is, is a really big part of, you know, of making sure that, that you have the opportunity that, that you're seeking. Um, who is accountable for diversity in your organization? Um, is your executive accountable for that? Um, or does that accountability lie somewhere else? And how far up uh, into the C-suite does that uh, diversity and accountability go to? Um, I would tell you that the, of the publicly traded organizations, only 32% report their, um, their workforce makeup. And um, you know, more and more shareholders, investors are requesting that that data become public. And so, you know, ask about those accountability measures. Where, who, who's responsible for ensuring workforce diversity, supply chain diversity, uh, and and what are the goals? Thank you both, Patricia. Um, you're reminding us this this diversity, equity, inclusion yeah. goes a lot further than sometimes we think about. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the work you do there. Thank you for reminding us today by being courageous. I think if we could leave with that, um, that would also be awesome today. And thank you, Daryl, for all you do to support women and girls and what you do to support me at Texas Women's Foundation. We thank you all for being here uh, today. The day is only half over, and there's a lot more to come. So our reception starts in about 15 minutes. Enjoy that. Engage with our inspiration wall if you have a few minutes. And then we have a fantastic speaker tonight for our dinner keynote. So make yourself at home, and we look forward to meeting you.